so in love with you. So in love with you. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. And in that well, I don't think of uh, love as, uh, in this context, as emotional bond. I don't think of it as uh, a weak But I, I think of love will they ever do. Strong. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory. With All no we say to America is be true to what you But I'm not concerned paper. about that now. I just want to do uh, God's it's a will. That you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you are trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain, practical gain, that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. I, don't think I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Good morning. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Uh, to Pastor Wheeler, First Lady Wheeler, thank you so much for welcoming us here today. Michelle and Malia and Sasha uh, and I are uh, We gather to be here, here on a Sabbath during a time of profound difficulty for our nation and for our world. And such a time that soothes the soul to seek out the divine in a spirit of prayer, to seek solace among a community of believers. But we are not here just to ask the Lord for his blessing. Uh, we aren't here just to interpret his scripture. Uh, we're also here to call on the memory of one of his noble servants, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King here in a Junior. church formed by freed slaves whose founding pastor had worn the Union blue. Here in a church from whose pews congregants set out for marches, and from whom choir anthems of freedom were heard, from whose sanctuary King himself would sermonize from time to time. And one of those times was Thursday, December 6th, 1956. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> On Thursday, December 6th, 1956. And before Dr. King had pointed us to the mountaintop, before he told us about his dream in front of the Lincoln Memorial, King came here as a 27-year-old preacher to speak on what he called the challenge of a new age. It was a period of triumph, but also uncertainty for Dr. King and his followers. Because just weeks earlier, the Supreme Court had ordered the desegregation of Montgomery's buses, a hard wrought, hard fought victory that would put an end to the 381 day historic boycott down in Montgomery, Alabama. And yet, as Dr. King rose to take that pulpit, the future still seemed daunting. It wasn't clear what would come next for the movement that Dr. King led. It wasn't clear how we were going to reach the promised land. Yes, the Supreme Court had ruled not only on the Montgomery buses, but also on Brown versus Board of Education. And yet, that ruling was defied. All we said. say to America is be true to what you said on paper. By schools and by states, they ignored it. With All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. So it's not hard for us then 
to imagine that moment. Whether the movement in which they had placed so many of their hopes, a movement in which they believed so deeply, could actually deliver on its promise. So here we are, more than half a century later, once again facing the challenges of a new age. Here we are, once more marching toward an unknown future, what I call the Joshua generation to their Moses generation, the great inheritors of progress paid for with sweat and blood and sometimes life itself. We've inherited the progress of unjust laws that are now overturned. We take for granted the progress of a ballot being available to anybody who wants to take the time to actually vote. We enjoy the fruits of prejudice and bigotry being lifted slowly, sometimes in fits and starts, but irrevocably from human hearts. It's that progress that made it possible for me to be here today, for the good people of this country to elect an African American, the 44th President of the United States of America. Reverend Wheeler mentioned the inauguration, last year's election. You know, on the heels of that victory over a year ago, there were some who suggested that somehow we had entered into a post-racial America. All those problems would be solved. There were those who argued that because I had spoke of a need for unity in this country, that our nation was somehow entering into a period of post-partisanship. That didn't work out so well. Uh, there was a hope shared by many that life would be better from the moment that I swore that oath. We know the promise of that moment has not yet been fully fulfilled. Because of an era of greed and irresponsibility that sowed the seeds of its own demise, because of persistent economic troubles unaddressed through the generations, because of a banking crisis that brought the financial system to the brink of catastrophe, we are being tested in our own lives and as a nation, as few have been tested before. Unemployment is at its highest level in more than a quarter of a century. Nowhere is it higher than the African American community. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So in love with you.